welcome again to our program, Revelation of the Coming King. I'm glad to be with you here again, and my name is Ranko Stefanovic. I'm professor in New Testament in the Seventh-day Adventist Theological Seminary, Andrews University. The courses that I teach there at Andrews are New Testament courses, even though my cognate is the Old Testament. So I believe that we should be student of the Bible, not just a part of the Bible. As you know that this series is about the book of Revelation. We are trying to cover the entire book from chapter one to chapter 22. In our last presentation, we try to understand who are those, about those who will be able to stand on that day, a uh, great day of the wrath of God? And the answer is 144,000. I hope that you found the topic very enjoying, but now we are coming probably to the most difficult portion of the book of Revelation. And the Christians have been fighting to find the meaning, the different opinions, and once again, we will try to go to the biblical principle, let the Bible tell us what that vision of seven trumpets is all about. But in dealing with that subject, we need the divine wisdom and the guidance of the Holy Spirit. So I would like to ask you that we bow our heads and ask God for his favor and his presence. Our heavenly Father, once again, we are here coming before you as we want to go and try to understand these two chapters of the book of Revelation about seven trumpets. Please be with us. Give us that clear understanding. But that's why we need your Holy Spirit. Let him teach us in all the truth. And Father, we are grateful to you for everything what you are doing for us. And we pray all of this in the precious name of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. As, we do, as we do it normally before we go to the text, uh, I'd like to encourage you again that once this presentation is over, that you uh, take different tools. Of course, the Bible is our primary tool. And you see, when you follow, okay, the instructions here, and you use these tools, you cannot be far away from understanding of the text. But we need also some other tools that literally uh, really point to those different Old Testament backgrounds. So I would like to suggest to you this book titled Revelation of Jesus Christ. It's verse by verse commentary on the book of Revelation, but the main purpose of this book really to give you those Old Testament and New Testament background texts for the understanding of the book of Revelation. And uh, the subject that we are covering today is Revelation 8 and 9 in next two presentations, this presentation, next presentation. Actually, the subject is covered here in this commentary from page 281, 200. 81, and you go on until we finish chapter 9. Okay. Let us now turn to Revelation chapter 8. And I would like us to read verse 2 of this chapter. We read before verse 1 about the silence in heaven. We saw what that silence was about. And now John said, we have the beginning, a beginning of a new vision. He says, and I saw the seven angels who stand before God and seven trumpets were given to them. So when we read in the rest of these two chapters, we will see about that later, that the, actually those seven angels are blow, blowing the trumpets. Every time when they blow the trumpets, or one angel blows his trumpet and another angel, you know, one after another, the events taking place on the earth. So before we go into the subject, we would like to ask ourselves the question, what are these trumpets all about? You see, we can express different opinions and 
have a very good guess about the meaning of these trumpets. But in the Old Testament, the concept, the blowing of the trumpets, was well known in ancient Israel. Actually, the entire life of the people of Israel was defined by the blowing of the trumpets. Whatever they did, it was on signal of the trumpets. Let me just provide a few insights here. There are several Hebrew words for trumpets that we translate in, in English. There is kind of trumpets that were made of hammered metal. They were regularly blown by the priests to summon people to announce those different festivals. It was an alarm, the time of uh, the war, signal for temple services, etc., etc. The metal, okay, trumpets. However, the best known trumpets in nation Israel were the shofar trumpets. They were made, okay, of rams, horns, and they were used as signaling instruments. Actually, evidently, this is the concept of the trumpets that is used here in Revelation 8 and 9. But what is the meaning of the trumpets? What does the blowing of the trumpet actually mean? See, again, we have to go to the Old Testament. You remember the first step is always to go to the Old Testament. And I'd like to invite you to open the book of Numbers, chapter uh, 10, The entire chapter actually is an instruction that God gave through Moses to the people of Israel with reference to the trumpets. But we will specifically focus on verses 8 to 10 because these verses provide for the background for the understanding of the seven trumpets in the book of Revelation. Are you ready there? One more time, the book of Numbers, chapter 10, verses 8 to 10. It says, the priestly sons of Aaron, moreover, shall blow the trumpets, and this shall be for you a perpetual statue throughout your generation. Can I stop here for a while? Can you help me? Who was in charge of the trumpets in ancient Israel? The priests. If the priests were in charge of blowing the trumpets, what does it suggest to us? that actually the trumpets were sacred instruments. Okay? Let us keep this in mind. Let's go next text. When you go to war in your land against the adversary who attacks you, then you shall sound an alarm with the trumpets that you may be remembered before the Lord your God and be saved from your enemies. Also in the day of your gladness, and in your appointed feasts, and on the first days of your month, you shall blow the trumpets over your burnt offerings, and over the sacrifices of your peace offerings, and they shall be as a reminder of you before your God. I am the Lord your God. Actually, this is the key Old Testament text that give us the insight into the theological meaning of the seven trumpets of Revelation chapters 8, 8, and 9. What, did we, what do we learn from these texts? So trumpets are sacred instruments blown by priests. Okay? Why were they blown? For a number of reasons. And please, I will use a kind of naive explanation here just to illustrate because this concept, this concept is here. You see, they were intended to call God to remember his people. Does it mean that God does not remember his people? But you notice here that this concept is, is here in the text. Let me, let me go back. It's verse 9 in book Numbers. You shall sound the alarm with the trumpets that you may be remembered before the Lord your God. And also verse 10, also in the day of your gladness, in your appointed feast, on the first day of your months, you shall blow the trumpets of your burnt offerings and over the sacrifices of your peace offerings, and they shall be a reminder of you before God. So they served to remind God of his covenant 
promises to his people. What does it mean? When people came to worship God, they would offer the sacrifices. At that moment, as the sacrifices were offered, the priests would take and blow the trumpets. And suddenly, I told you in a naive way, suddenly, as the priests blow the trumpets, God remembers his people and he forgives their sins. Or people go there to war. And evidently they are overwhelmed, almost defeated by their enemies. At that moment, the priests blow the trumpets. And God looks there from heaven. He said, oh, my people are there in a trouble. He remembers his people and his covenant promises to protect them. And he comes and delivers them from their enemies. I know you will say this is just a story for children. But please, would you go with me to another Old Testament text? Second Chronicles chapter 13. We have actually the real event, okay, that illustrates this statement that God remembers his people from Numbers chapter 10, uh, 10 verses 8 to 10. Are you there? Second Chronicles chapter 13, verses 12 to 15. It talks about the war between the northern and the southern kingdom of Israel. It says, now be be behold, God is with us at your head and his priest with the signal trumpets to sound the alarm against you. Is the king actually tried to encourage people. He said, don't be afraid. The priests with the trumpets are here with us. O sons of Israel, do not fight against the Lord God of your fathers, for you will not succeed. Now we go to verse 13. But Jeroboam has set an ambush to come from the rear so that Israel was in front of Judah and the ambush was behind them. When Judah turned around, behold, they were attacked from front and rear. So they cried to the Lord. Now, now look, look something. They cried to the Lord and, they, and the priests blew the trumpets. What happens next? Then the men of Judah raised a war cry. And when the men of Judah raised the war cry, then it was that the God rooted Jeroboam and all Israel before Abijah and Judah. Do you see the practical illustration of this? The people of Israel were there in the trouble, almost defeated by their enemies. What did they do? I'd like you to pay something very, very, very important. Yes, Because it's not just about the blowing of the trumpets. It says that the priest blew the trumpets. What the people do? They shouted, they cry to the Lord. You see, the trumpets and the prayers of God's people, they go together. It's not simply about blowing of the trumpets. I would suggest to you that actually the blowing of the trumpets was a call to people to pray to God. Amen. And when the trumpet sounded, people prayed, then God remembered his promises to be with his people, and he came to deliver them. Amen. By the way, when you go to the Old Testament, trumpets are associated with very important events in the Old Testament history. When the law was given from Sinai, the sound of the trumpet. When Jericho was destroyed, you remember that? Trumpet. By the way, when we read the prophetic books, it is at the sound of the trumpet that the day of the Lord will come. In the New Testament, Apostle Paul talks in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. He talks in 2 Thessalonians chapter 4 that Jesus will come at the sound of the trumpet. In the sound of the trumpet, there will be a resurrection of that. So you see, the concept of the sound of the trumpet it's a well-known concept. But keep, let us keep this Old Testament background. The trumpets and the prayers, they go together. When people pray, when the trumpets sound, then God remembers his people praying to him. Are you still with me? So now, in light of this, I'd like you now to invite that we go back to our text in Revelation 
chapter 8. But I'd like you to observe something that is very important here. We have another literary feature here. So chapter 8 from verse 2. And I saw the seven angels, I'm repeating this text, who stand before God, and seven trumpets were given to them. Can you now skip the next three verses? And would you go to verse 6? And the seven angels who had the seven trumpets prepared themselves to sound them. You see, when you read verse 2, when you read verse 6, it's chronological order. He, uh, John sees the angels, now they're sounding the trumpets. But what is the problem here in the text? That between the verse 2 and the verse 6, there are three other verses inserted. Actually, they function as another interlude. And that interlude actually is telling us what the seven trumpets are all about. Are you with me? So let us now focus on this interlude. You see, it's inserted between verses 2 and 6. Talk about the angels with the trumpets and when the angels start blowing the trumpets. So let's see it. Another angel came and he stood at the altar holding a golden censer. And much incense was given to him so that he might add it to the prayers of all the saints on the golden altar which was before the throne. And the smoke of the incense with the prayers of the saints went up before God out of the angel's hand. Then the angel took the censer and filled it with the fire of the altar and threw it to the earth. And that followed peals of thunder and sounds and flashes of lightning and earthquake. When the censer is thrown down, creating that great noise, it is at that moment that seven angels started blowing the trumpets one after another. Are you still with me? Please. I have to say here something very important. This text is very important very significant, unfortunately, very much misunderstood text. Many futurist Christians, including my dear brothers, sisters from my own denomination, some of them, they go to this text and they conclude that the throwing of the censor down, creating that noise, actually signifies so-called the clause of the probation the cessation of Jesus' intercession there in heaven, and then they include, since the blowing of the trumpets comes after throwing of the censer, that actually seven trumpets are still in the future that will take place after the close of intercession there in heaven. So it's a future event to take place before the second coming of Christ. However, this is completely opposite to the biblical evidences and what we know about the temple services in the Old Testament, especially in the first century in Jerusalem temple. So please you now allow me that we go and address those issues one more time. We have to keep in mind that verses three to six, they do not follow, they do not follow the chronological order Okay, of, of verse 2 and 6. You see, it's a clear insertion. It's a clear interlude. And the purpose of this interlude is really to provide for us the theological explanations of the, of the, of the seven trumpets. So please, I would like you now to, that you be with me because I would like to describe a little bit in graphic way. So what we, what we have here is... You read in your Bibles in English. This is another scholarly article that I had to write. John sees an angel. Where is the angel seen by? By the altar. Unfortunately, this is completely wrong translation. And please forgive me. People who translate the Bible are great linguistics, they know, but sometimes the theological presuppositions affect that translation. Why? Because they believe 
that this scene takes place there in heaven. And in heaven, there is only one altar, according to the Bible. Which altar is? The altar of incense. So they say, hey, altar of incense, it's object size of this. So how can angel be upon the altar, as Greek says? So that they assume that actually the angel was seen at the altar. Are you with me? I will suggest to you, I challenge this view. Please, would you go with me back there to the text? It says, verse 3, Another angel came and stood at the altar holding a golden censer. Where was the angel standing? They said, at the altar. Okay. And much incense was given to him so that he might add it to the prayers of all saints on the golden altar which is before the throne. Did you notice here? At the end of this verse, that golden altar is mentioned. And when you go to the Old Testament, the sanctuary system, there is only one golden altar that is in temple. And this is the altar of incense. Now, would it be unusual that John sees the angel standing at the altar, assuming that this is the altar of incense? An angel takes the incense and he offers on the golden altar, which is also the altar of incense. Would it be normal that he sees angels standing at the golden altar and the incense is offered then on the altar? Because the first altar is not the golden altar. It's the altar of burnt offerings, of sacrifices. And please, I want just to portray to you how this altar looked like. We have from Josephus Flavius, from Jewish work Mishnah, we have the description of the altar in Jerusalem. And usually when we talk about altar, what do we think? We think about a small object when the lamb was put. And so, so many times we are impacted by popular pictures of artists that are doing that. By the way, how they portray that that altar had stairways. I forgot the measure. It's a huge object that the priests, they have to climb there to the top there. It was a sizable, a sizable object there. The priest would go there, you see. People climb there. Priest, the priest would stand here and they would offer, offer the sacrifice. That's why John sees that angel upon the altar. Where is the altar of sacrifices located? On earth. And here at this altar, the angel takes the censer and he was given the incense and he takes that incense where? To offer up on the golden altar there in heaven. That golden altar, John makes very clear, is before the throne of God. He says to open that incense with the prayers of God's people. Oh boy. Something here is very significant and very, very important is. I will tell you some, something from the Mishnah, what they say about the custom that's reflected here in chapter, in chapter 8. But I would like to ask you a question. Have you ever thought, why is so significant that at this altar, the altar of sacrifices, the angel is seen as taking the incense and the prayers of God's people to take there before God. Let me just remind you, if you remember, just a few presentations earlier, we talked about the altar of sacrifices. And John saw beneath that altar the blood, the souls of God's people who were persecuted and they were martyred there. What were they doing there? Praying to God, asking God, how long, Lord God Almighty, will you not avenge our blood and judge those who dwell on the, on the earth? 
But you know, so many times when we pray to God, our prayers seem to be unheard. But you see, it is with this vision, this interlude, this interlude is inserted intentionally here to tell us that now the time has come and there is an angel here. He comes and takes those prayers of God's people and takes them there before God. He offers those prayers on the golden altar of incense there before God. What happens when the angel offers those prayers before God? Now the judgment comes. The same angel takes that censer that took the prayers of God's people there before God, fills with the fire from this altar. He comes out of the holy place there in heaven and he throws the censer down. And there was such a noise, lightning and, and all kinds of sounds. And that moment when he does it, the angels, they blow the trumpets. When the first angel blows the trumpet, there is something that takes place on the earth. The judgments of God are on those who persecute God's, God's people. Okay? Let me document this, what we were talking about. In the Jewish work, Mishnah, we have the clear explanations of what we are talking here about. The people who believe that Revelation 8, 3 to 5 portrays the clause of the probation, they are wrong for one simple reason, because the Jewish war commissioner describes what was going on in the temple in Jerusalem under the title Tamid. Are you familiar with the word Tamid? It's the Hebrew word that we translate as the word daily, that describes what the priests were doing every day in the temple. It's not the day of atonement. It's not the close of the probation. It's something that was taking place every day temple. And they said, they said, the priest would offer the sacrifice here. We're talking about evening sacrifice. At that moment, the priest would come there to the altar and other priests would come to him and bring him the golden censer. Another priest would help that priest to put a fire into the censer and they give him to incense. People are standing outside and the priest there. At that moment, the priest would go down from this altar and walk into the holy place of the temple. People would fall down there on the ground and be praying to God. He would go there into the temple into the holy place, offer the incense before God. When he ministered the incense, finishing, finished the ministering incense, then he would go and fill that censer now that in which originally was incense, fill with the fire there. People were outside praying, waiting for him to appear and he would come out triumphantly announce that the incense was offered and he would take a censer and throw down. Actually, Jewish work missionary said, the sound of the censer was so loud that people could not hear the voice of their neighbor. Of course, it's exagger exaggeration. Actually, the next paragraph said that the sound was so loud that even could be heard from Jerusalem to Jericho there. Evidently, they wanted to put so strong emphasis on the sound, okay? The moment when the priest threw the censer, the priest, seven priests with the trumpets, they started blowing the trumpet, announcing that they, the Tamid service for that, for that day. See, friends, you understand now what we have in Revelation chapter 8. It reflects the daily or Tamid services in the earthly temple. This is not the clause of the probation. It has nothing to do with, with that. It simply reflects the daily services, something that was taking place on the daily base there in, 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 in the temple in Jerusalem. Are you still with me? So now, what is actually the meaning of all of this that we try to understand? Please let, let me just remind you of several background texts what we have here in this interlude, 
The first important text is Ezekiel chapter 10, verses 1 to 7. When Ezekiel saw in the vision an expanse that was over the heads of the cherubim, something like sapphire stone in appearance resembling a throne appeared about them. And he spoke to the man clothed in linen, and he said, Enter between the whirling wheels under the cherubim, fill your hands with coals of fire from between the cherubim and scatter them over city, city Jerusalem. And he entered into my sight. Then the cherub stretched out his hand from between the cherubim to the fire which was between the cherubim, took some and put it into the hands of one clothed in linen who took it and went out. What is this vision all about? It's actually about God's judgment over unfaithful Jerusalem. So this vision of Ezekiel is telling us actually what this interlude is all about because this interlude reflects the vision, the vision of Ezekiel. By the way, let me remind you just a few biblical texts. If you go to Psalm 141, Psalm 141, 2, may my prayer be counted as incense before you, the lifting up of my hands as the evening offering. You can see how this text really tell us what the offering of that incense is all about. But I would like us to go to the book of Revelation because the book of Revelation really gives us the meaning of, the in, of this incense. Chapter 5, verse 8. When he had taken the book, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the Lamb, each one holding a harp and golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. Do we have any doubt what actually this incense is all about? Now, please, I like you that you see now co connection. When it says in symbolical language that the angel was there at the altar, up, actually on the altar, up on the altar, when he took that incense and he offered that incense up on the golden altar before the throne, before God, together with the prayers of God's people, now see what this is all about. These are not any prayers. These are the prayers of God's harmed, persecuted, and oppressed people from the fifth seal. You remember that God gave them the promise, just wait for a while. <laughs> the time is coming when I will judge your enemies. But please now, please now, this is very important. But actually, this interlude is giving us a little bit different message. Not only that God one day will judge the enemies of his people, he's telling them, I am already judging your enemies. Yeah. Yeah. Amen. Let me stop for a while. That God will judge the enemies of his people refers to what? To the seven last plagues. But seven trumpets are God's judgment already in the present time judging enemies. So the seven trumpets are the precursor, a foretaste of that great judgment. The seven trumpets are actually the expression of the wrath of God okay, to help his people to deliver them. But when we come to seven last place, you will see the seven last plagues actually are the fullness of God's wrath. You see the seven trumpets are mixed with the mercy. They tended even the enemies of, 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 of God's people to bring to repentance. But the seven last plagues, they're not intended to bring anybody to repentance because they take place after the close probation. Seven trumpets are before the close of the probation. And we will see that chapters 10, 11 show clearly that even while the sixth trumpet is blown, there is the preaching of the gospel and the two witnesses are doing that, proclaiming the everlasting gospel to the, to the world. So the seven trumpets actually are run the same period of history as the seven seals. Okay, now you have to help me. I just want that you see how we have the keys in the book of Revelation. Can we go back one more time to, to uh, how Mishnah describes the daily services? According to Mishnah, to the Mishnah. When did the angel, sorry, when did the priest take the incense to offer there in the holy place? When? 
after the offering the evening sacrifice. Here we have a clue of the beginning of the trumpets because we have 2,000 years ago that the sacrifice was offered on the cross of Calvary. It was after Jesus' death on the cross and his ascension into the heavenly places that it is after that that the seven trumpets are blown. And both the sixth uh, seal and the seventh seal and the sixth trumpet and the seventh trumpet actually bring us to the time of the end. So we have here the clear indication that the seals and the trumpets, they run the same course of history. Does not mean that they, each seal and trumpet, they match there, but they cover the same period, period of Christian history. I'd like you now to notice something else. Please now you have to cooperate with me. I like to bring to your memory what we talk about seals. Let's see how the seals are organized. Please, I will use the blackboard here. Please, the seals, they fall in groups. What is the first group of seals? Four horsemen. Okay, let's put it here, seals. You have four horsemen. What comes next? Two seals, do you remember that? Why two seals? Because before the last seal, we have the interlude. Okay, so we have two seals. Seal fifth and six. And then we have the seventh seal. But before the seventh seal, we have a kind of interlude and it's chapter seven. Do you see that? Please, what is the purpose of chapter seven? of this interlude to identify God's people, to tell us about those who will be able to stand in the day of the wrath of God. They are God's end time people, are you with me? Those who will live before the second coming of Christ. Let's go to the trumpets, okay? Let me put here. How are the seven trumpets organized? In the same way. You can see we have here four trumpets. Why four trumpets? If you can just see the first four trumpets, they're just in one chapter, very short, two, three verses about each chapter, uh, about each trumpet. Can you notice it there? Mm -hmm. But then, if you go to chapter 8, verse 13, only 12 verses about four trumpets, you read in verse 3 about war, against the inhabitants of the, of the earth, those who live on the earth, because of the last three trumpets, which are actually three wars. They're different. So once again, we have here two trumpets. And then there is, oh sorry, this is not seven, actually another one trumpet, okay. And then there is the seven trumpet that comes actually in chapter 11, very far later. But before the sixth and the seventh trumpet, what do we have? We have another interlude, which is actually chapter 10. You remember John and eating the scroll that was sweet in his mouth, bitter in his stomach. Then we go to chapter 11, we have the two witnesses, you remember that. So you, we have here, we have here chapter 9, Sorry, chapter 10, okay, from verse 1 to chapter 11, verse 14, we have another interlude. You will notice here how the two interludes, they fit into the same historical time, just before the second coming of Christ. What is the purpose of this interlude? To identify God's people who will be in the time of the end. What is the purpose of this interlude? To tell us what these people will be doing at the time before the second coming of Christ. They are commissioned to preach the gospel and they will go through that sweet, bitter experience as they proclaim the gospel. By the way, we have a great message when we come to that. So we have to wait until we come to chapter 11 
and also uh, to chapter 10 and also to, chap to chapter 11. So you can now see how actually the seven trumpets and the seven seals, they cover the same historical period. There is no teaching of the book of Revelation that there are first seals and after that trumpets. Trumpets and seals, they run parallel. I hope that they both begin with the first century after the cross and both end with the second coming of Christ and actually the seventh seal and the seven trumpets describe the time after the second coming of Christ. So one more time before we go to the seven trumpets, please, can somebody help me? What are the trumpets all about? They are God's judgments in response to the prayer of his people. Let's keep the Old Testament background. When God's people are in trouble, what do they do? They pray to God and they blow trumpets. Do you see the same concept that we have here in this interlude? So please, we have now the clue what the trumpets are about, the God's judgments in answering the prayers of his people. Okay, so with this information, now we are going to analyze and to see what these seven trumpets are all about. So the prayer of God's people are answered. They are heard there before God. And now the angels are blowing, blowing the, 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 the trumpets. And now let us go and to see about the first, the first trumpet that is portrayed in verse seven, in verse seven. It says that the first angel sounded and there came hail and fire mixed with the blood and they were thrown to the earth and the third of the earth was burned up and a third of the trees were burned up and all the green grass was burned up. We have here a very strange symbolism. But when you read this, you have, okay, you have when the angel blows the trumpet, that there was hail and fire mist mixed with the blood. By the way, what is going on here, it's an allusion to the Egyptian plague. If you remember that one of the Egyptian plagues, we have the fire mixed with hail and killing not only the animals, but also killing the people who found themselves there, there in, the, in, the, in the field. In the Old Testament, as we read, God very often used hail mixed with fire, which caused the bloodshed as the means of the judgment against the enemies of his people. Probably one of the best texts is Ezekiel chapter 38, verses 22 and 23. Let's read this text. Ezekiel says, with pestilence and with the blood, I will enter into the judgment with him and I will reign on him and on his troops and on many people who are with him, a torrential rain will hailstone, fire and brimstone. I will magnify myself, sanctify myself and make myself known in the sight of many nations and they will know that I'm Lord. Let's read another text, which is actually Isaiah 44, 2 to 4. We read here, thus says the Lord who made you and formed you from the womb, who will help you. Do not fear, O Jacob, my servant, a new Yashurum whom I have chosen, for I will pour out my water on the thirsty land and streams on the dry ground. I will pour out my spirit on your offspring and my blessing on your descendants. And now please pay attention to this. And they will spring up among the grass like poplars by streams of water. These two texts are crucial for the understanding of the meaning of the first trumpet. Number one, we see that hail and fire mixed with blood is a frequent 
symbol in the Old Testament of judgment. So we're talking here about the judgment. But you will notice that all of these actually affects the grass and the trees. Keep in one more time that the book of Revelation is a symbolic book. So the question is, are different commentators true? They say, here we have the destruction of vegetation. Come on. Do God's judgment concern grass and trees? No, it concerns human beings. When you go to the Old Testament, trees and grass are frequently symbols for God's people. I can give you so many texts. By the way, you will continue to study for yourself. You will go to the commentary. You will find there many, many, many texts to support it. We just read here in Isaiah, this chapter 44, and you will see that God clearly describes his people as grass and trees. So this ale and fire mixed with blood, which destroyed the trees and green grass, symbolize God's judgment against apostate believers who have joined the ranks of the opponents of the opponent's God. Please allow me. At this point, I have to read another text that comes actually from Jesus, which is very, very significantly. In Luke chapter 23, Jesus talks about judgment against Jerusalem, unfaithful Jerusalem. Remember when Jesus was taken there to the place of crucifixion? There are some uh, women there standing and crying. And Jesus told them, don't cry because of me. Cry about what will happen to you and to this city. And now comes this statement, Luke 23, 31. For if they do these things, when the tree is green, what will happen when it is dry? Actually, Jesus refers to himself as the green tree. When they treat this green tree in such a way, how will they treat the tree that is dry? He refers to the Jewish people who evidently did not have any life in themselves, spiritual life, because they rejected God, they rejected the Messiah. And if you read the text that follows, you can see clearly that actually Jesus predicted here the judgment that will come very soon upon Jerusalem that it didn't happen in AD 70. When Romans, they came and actually destroyed Jerusalem. So actually these words of Jesus together with all those different Old Testament background is telling us, they're telling us what actually the first trumpet is about. Actually the judgment of God always begins from the household of God. The green tree and the green grass stands as a symbol for God's people. So in our best understanding, we have here actually the judgment of God upon the leaders of the Jewish nations, the events that took place in AD 70 with the destruction of Jerusalem. Please, let me clarify it. Yes, the first judgment heralds the judge, uh, the first trumpet heralds the judgment upon those of God's people who were involved in, in crucifixion of Christ and the persecution of the early church. But we have to keep in mind, many Jews actually they accepted Christ. So please, we aren't talking about the people and to reject them and to invent strange doctrines about the punishment that came upon them. We are not talking here simply about Jewish people. We are talking about the Jewish leaders. And a minority of those, of those uh, leaders who rejected Christ, they became the enemies of the early church. And evidently there were judgments that came naturally upon, upon them. And the first judge, uh, trumpet actually describes that judgment that came upon the Jewish leaders because of their attitude toward Christ, rejection of Christ, and their how to, how to say, antagonistic attitude to the early church because they're mainly responsible for the persecution of the early church. Just as in the Old Testament, God used alien fire as his judgment against the enemies of Israel. So now the sounding of the first trumpet actually heralds the judgment upon those 
who crucified Christ and actually who were responsible for the persecution of those early Christians and the early church. But now we are going there to the second trumpet. And let us read there in verse 8. The second angel sounded and something like a great mountain burning with fire was thrown into the sea. And the third of the sea became blood. And the third of the creatures which were in the sea had life died and the third of the ships were destroyed. Boy, now what is this? We saw about the first trumpet. I told you that we are dealing with very difficult section of the book of Revelation. But when we have difficult, a difficult text, what are we supposed to do? Go to the Old Testament. So let's go to the Old Testament. What, 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 what is here the key? The key is the burning mountain with fire that was thrown into the sea. Can you keep this in mind? Let's go back, back to Jeremiah 51, 22. Let's go to the Old Testament. Jeremiah 51, 22. And Jeremiah talks about uh, Babylon. So we're dealing with the prophecy against Babylon, who was the enemy of God's people. And we read there, Behold, I am against you, O destroying mountain. How does Jeremiah refer to, 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 to Babylon? Destroying mountain who destroys the whole earth, declares the Lord. I will stretch out my hand against you and roll you down from the cracks. I will make you a burned out mountain. Do you see this concept of burned mountain where it is taken from? It's taken from the Old Testament. But then we go to the end of chapter 51, Jeremiah 51, and we read verses 63 and 64. We read there, it's about the same prophecy against the same world power against Babylon. As soon as you finish reading this scroll, God said to Jeremiah, you will tie a stone to it and throw it into the middle of the Euphrates and say, just so shall Babylon sink down and not rise again because of the calamity that I'm going to bring upon her and they will become exhausted Thus far are the words of Jeremiah. You see, in the Old Testament, who is the burning mountain? And who will be taken and thrown into the deep water, sink there, and will not rise again? It's actually ancient, ancient Babylon. So actually, this Old Testament prophecy provides for us the clue on the meaning of this second, second trumpet. It helped us to unlock the symbolism of this vision with reference to this burning mountain that we have in the, in the second trumpet. In the time of John in the first century, the Christians, they called Rome Babylon. By the way, if you go to 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 13, you will see that Peter, who was at that time in Rome, he sends greetings to Christians from Babylon. Okay, we, we have to understand it. Just as ancient Babylon was responsible for the persecution of God's people, Israel, so Rome is now responsible for the persecution of the early church. As judgment came, came upon ancient Babylon, so now the judgment is announced against, against Rome. Okay. Look something here, that this burning mountain, which is evidently Rome and the Roman Empire, it says it will be cast into the sea. It's actually the sea that will destroy this burning mountain. I'd like to invite you to go with me to Isaiah chapter 57, verse 20. This is just one of numerous Old Testament texts that give us the meaning of the sea. It says, but the wicked are like the tossing sea, for it cannot be quiet, and its waters toss up refuse and mud. By the way, if you go to the book of Revelation, you will find out that the prostitute Babylon in Revelation 17 sits on many waters, which is actually a reference to Babylon. But in verse 15, those many waters, okay, are referred to as many nations, peoples, and tongues. So you can see that in the Bible, 
the roaring sea, stormy sea, it's always symbol for the wicked who never have a peace. They're always rebellious. They are always fight against God and his people. So now we have here a clue for what is going on. We are talking about many nations that will turn against Rome and finally bring Rome to destruction. But there's something else. It says that what happens here, even on a third of the ship of this mountain will be destroyed. In the book of Ezekiel, by the way, we read in chapter 27, verses 29 and 32, it says, all who handle, it's about Babylon, the sailors and all the pilots of the sea will come down from their ships. They will stand on the land and they will make their voice, voice heard over you and will cry bitterly. They will cast dust on their heads and will wallow in ashes. Moreover, in their wailing, they will take up lamentation for you and lament over you, who is like Tyre, like her, who is silent in the midst of the sea. You can see how actually the book of Revelation uses this Old Testament language. So friends, in the conclusion, what do we have in the first two trumpets? I'd like to um, mention something. The trumpets, they always run in pairs. The first two trumpets are God's judgments against whom? The two powers, the two nations that crucified Christ and that were responsible for the persecution of the early church. So the first and the second trumpets, they talk about God's judgment against the leaders of the Jewish nations, not the Jewish people, the, the leaders of the Jewish nations, and also God's judgment against Rome that took place in the fifth century. So what we have here is that the answer of God's people are heard, God is coming in judgment, and God does everything in order to vindicate, to vindicate his people and to bring judgment on their enemies. Yes, we have a powerful God.